One of the houses I'm handling right now is a $2.8 million house that's in the middle of getting their complete tile roof replaced and has interior damage. Well, you know, again, you don't do a job like that real quick, right? Well, right. the whole tile roof was off and it rained. Oh no. Now, is that gonna be part <laughs> of the insurance claim or is that gonna be something else? And again, this is where I can help this person that um, has done well in life and doesn't know anything about insurance. Uh, this is where I can add my experience to him and help them take care of this problem. Well, my name is David Hall. I am currently a public adjuster, but I started on the independent adjuster side. Um, I started uh, right about 2011. Um, I got my independent adjuster's license. My wife and I did it together. And I did that just as I retired from the firehouse from 30 years at Columbus Fire Department. And that's Columbus, Ohio. Uh, my career was coming to an end. My body was letting me know that I was not a young man no more. So it was time to move on to something different. And my wife and I always wanted to travel. So we decided we purchased a motor home and, and jumped into the industry of claims adjusting. Uh, we started out, uh, my wife probably spent two months at that time filling out every online application she possibly could. And with the technology at that time, that meant going on their website, printing out the application, filling it out by hand, scanning it back in and sending it into every uh, known firm that we could find. Yeah. Uh, eventually that worked. We got hired by uh, several of the big firms and got deployed by pilot for State Farm a few times. Uh, a lot of good experience with working for State Farm. People, you know, fuss about them. And, you know, at the public adjusting site at this time, they're not our favorite company, but I always remember they did a very, very good job of teaching you to be a good IA um, when it came to making sure that you touch the file, you enter the information um, and, and customer service. So it, it's, it's not that something wasn't learned, but yeah, again, time progresses and you move forward. Um, we've done that for various firms over the last, you know, nine, 10 years. Uh, but recently it's come to the point where we decided we, um, we thought we could be more helpful to the insureds on the other side of the fence. So we have converted our licenses over to public adjusting and started our own firm here in Florida, just outside of Orlando. And we are now, um, gathering customers, gathering contractors, working with attorneys and moving forward and uh, assisting um, customers and insureds from this side of the fence. So it's a very similar, there's some differences of course, but the, the, the whole goal is still to take care of the customer, to take care of the insured. Yeah, and I, I would say for, for folks out there who um, don't exactly know what a public adjuster is or as a, or a PA as we, as we kind of refer to them, and I guess you guys probably refer to yourselves, um, what is exactly a public adjuster and, and kind of how does that work? And really what's like, what's the difference between a, a PA and an IA? Well, as the independent adjuster, you're working basically for a vendor that's working contracting to an insurance company. So your paycheck slash responsibility always lies with the insurance company. Um, not that that can't work out well, not that things can't be done well, but the public adjuster, on the other hand, is on the other side of the fence. We are hired directly by the insured to represent the insured in their claim as they process it um, with the insurance company. So some of our skills are very, very similar. Um, the, the whole scoping and estimating and looking at the damages and making sure the damages are covered, um, very, very similar to a independent adjuster. Um, after being on both sides, in, in my opinion, in the current environment that we have with independent adjusters, uh, public adjusters are, are really dig into the policy and dig into the details of the policy on a much deeper basis than most independents are asked to do at this time. Um, but on the other hand, I've also seen that public adjusters um, many times are not quite as qualified or as experienced at doing the estimating and the scoping side. They, some of them have the opinion of let's just sign the people up and move forward 
and worry about the coverage issue later. And I, I don't like that. That's not what I want to do. And that can actually do harm to the insured. So I, I don't try to participate in that at all. Um, there's many firms out there that if you have uh, two claims within a policy period that you happen to hit the wonderful lottery and they don't renew you the next year. Well, I don't want to do that to an insured if the claims aren't valid and the things aren't reasonable things to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's still helping the insured. It's still doing estimates. It's still doing inspections, uh, still working to Xactimate. It's just from a different viewpoint. I got gotcha. you. Well, very interesting. So, so really, I mean, there there is another reason for a public adjuster to be a thing other than to just annoy independent adjusters when they're trying to do property claims, right? <laughs> well, there's a there's a, a, a large um, portion of the people that want to see it as a, a a big contest, a big opposing thing, and the reality is that is there on the extremes. But most guys and, and ladies in this business, we just want to do what's right for the insured. Um, we might have a different viewpoint of what right is, but that's really what we want to do. Um, you know, as an independent adjuster, you, you really don't need to treat a public adjuster any differently than, than anybody else to speak of. Um, you do need to kind of look up the rules of that particular state you're working in. There's a few small rules of, of uh, that on the public adjusting side that um, apply to the independent adjusters. Uh, one of which is that uh, public adjusters have the um, ability to decline an inspection or a meeting for up to 48 hours um, so that we have a 48 hour cushion of when we can have a meeting. Are you new to the industry and wondering how you can get started as an independent adjuster with little or no experience? I mean, how can you get any experience if you can't get any experience, right? It's a problem as old as time in any profession. While you may have heard of the IA firm and insurance recruiting specialists at the best IRS, the IRS stood for Insurance Recruiting Specialists. However, The Best recently did a complete rebrand that better reflects their company goals, changing their name to The Best Claims Solutions. Because there has been a considerable increase in task-driven solutions requested by The Best Claims' clients, adjusters can now get their foot in the door and gain experience with The Best Claims Solutions, The Best Inspect program. Not only that, but The Best Claims also offers continuous training to you, the adjuster, and their compliance department helps keep you current on your licenses so you'll never find yourself hitting the pause button on a deployment while you re-up your licenses. When you sign up for The Best Claims' roster, you'll be in contact with a dedicated recruiter who will learn more about your skills, experience, and areas of expertise. And once you're onboarded, anytime that there's an opening that fits your skill set, you'll get a call right away. At The Best Claims, their services are 100% completely free for candidates. Once you're on the roster, you'll have access to independent adjusting opportunities around the country so that you can select what's right for you. Get access to the totally free top five tips for preparing for a hurricane deployment video guide over to adjustertv.com slash the best claims. Watch the top five tips for preparing for a hurricane deployment for free right now by going to adjustertv.com slash the best claims. Um, so that's something that an independent adjuster needs to be aware of that that is completely appropriate and completely legal for them to do. Uh, I'm not sure how it applies in every other state uh, one of the other differences I'm noticing between public adjusters and independent adjusters is that the, the rules and, and processes for independent adjusters are very, very consistent throughout the country that I work. But public adjusters are far less consistent in the different states that they go to. So it's, uh, it's something to take the time to research. Um, you know, if you get sent to say, as an example, North Carolina to go work for a period of time, it would probably be good as you're setting up to just do some research on what are the rules for IAs and what are the rules for public adjusters so that you can um, be aware of, of, you know, what both of your responsibilities are. Yeah, and it actually brings up a, a, a good question. So I think a lot of adjusters are scared 
of working with public adjusters because they, you know, especially newer folks, they get on social media and they see all kinds of horror stories about people talking about PAs or the interactions they may have had with the PA or a contractor or even an attorney. Um, but is there like, is, are there kind of like some best practices for working with the PA? Um, is there a, is there a, like a, a better way to kind of mitigate that potential or should, should adjusters really even have anxiety about it, you know, to begin with? In, in my opinion, we're, we're, we're both there as professionals. So I really don't see any reason to treat a public adjuster any, any different than a contractor or anybody else. It's just another person in the process. Um, although we have a little bit of, of authority to negotiate and to represent the insured, that doesn't give us unlimited authority to do things. It just gives us a couple more um, steps that we can take over, especially contractors. Um, as far as nervousness, uh, again, there's going to be outliers on both sides. There's public adjusters that that uh, want to start the first meeting with demanding this and demanding that and demanding that. And, you know, those are the first ones that you just step back and say, yeah, OK, we'll take care of it when my estimate's done. Um, but they, they really are not the ones that you want to worry yourself. Um, most of it is just an interaction. You know, talk to the public adjuster as if they are the insured. Uh, you know, have them show you around the house and what damages that, that, that they are claiming. Uh, have them explain to you where did, where did the damage start? How did it process to here? You know, if you have questions on why are you asking for X, Y, or Z to be covered, by all means, ask them. Um, the good ones will know the answers to those things long before the insured uh, steps in because the good ones have taken the time to do a good scope and a good estimate, and they know the answers to those questions. The ones that may not be so good have to refer everything back to the insured, and that's where you have to wonder how good of a person you're dealing with. But again, treat them professionally, and at the end of the day, we're both going to go home and try to take care of the insured. Right. Yeah. Um, and I've, I mean, I've dealt with some, some public adjusters and generally speaking, it's been on hurricanes, like on the coast, especially in the Northeast or in Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm doing hail, it's probably 99.97% of the claim hail claims I've ever run in city in any city in the Midwest. I've never even heard of anybody talking to a public adjuster. Um, I did have a public adjuster in Denver who was um, kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit, I think, of what was um, legit, but because they had a bunch of stuff on their website about um, if you, if, you know, you're obviously you're familiar with wood shake roofs and when they get older, they kind of wear thin to where they have that feathering oh, and there's uh -huh. a, a hole appears, oh, yeah. right? They had all yep. this documentation and all this stuff on their website about how that hole was actually a hail hit. And it could certainly be argued that the, the hail could hit that paper thin shingle and break it, and we would call that damage. But just having those holes there, like we call it feathering on those, sh those shakes, is not damage. But they had built their whole business around that in Denver, which had, at the time, it was several years ago, um, was a lot of wood shake roofs and a lot of people, they were very, very expensive, as you know. Um, so these guys are kind of running around trying to drum up business about it. But out of all the PA experiences I've ever had, that was probably the only one. And the guy was super cool about it too. Um, we never argued or anything. I just said no and moved on. Um, but every other time it's, you know, a lot of times the PAs will, um, if, they're, if they're good and they are uh, diligent, they will, kind of show up with a really complete estimate and they'll go through that policy and, um, you know, there'll be things in the policy that the, a lot of times, like you said, the IAs don't know about because it's in their best interest to say, okay, well, this under coverage D, there's some extra things here that we could take care of for the insured as well. And they're going to be included on the, on the PA's estimate. Um, and the, the IA may not have never have dug into this loss of use or whatever in, co in coverage D or coverage E or whatever it is. Um, so they, you know, a lot of times I think if IAs, like you said, if they educate themselves starting out, um, if they, and if they're really versed in the policy, then 
those conversations, which could turn contentious where the IA is arguing with the PA over something that they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, if they did know and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you for pointing that out. Then you just move on down the road, right? And then you write your estimate as best you can as, a, as an IA and then kind of see where things shake out. So a question for you, though, um, say... I've got a tree that falls right through the middle of the house, and it's a $125,000 estimate that I write, and the PA comes up with a $180,000 or a $200,000 estimate. Um, what, what happens then? Because I think that's, that's one of the kind of the, on these bigger claims um, are, the, are where you're probably more likely to see a public adjuster because... Uh, you know, insureds may be nervous about whether they're going to be able to get everything that they're owed to get the work completed so their house can be back the way it was. Um, so you're not going to generally see a PA on like a $5,000 fence loss, but you will see them on the, the higher dollar one. So what happens when you get like a really big disparity um, between the PA and the IA? If you're an auto claims adjuster or appraiser, you already know that SCA is one of the top companies that you can work for on the auto side. But if you're a property adjuster who's never done any auto, you may have never even heard of SCA. We've heard of them now. SCA Claim Services is launching their property division and they're poised to bring their decades of claims management experience and extensive resources to the property side of things. Insurance carriers already trust SCA because they know they will always receive a high level of customer service and policyholder satisfaction. And with literally millions of claims handled in SCA's four decade history, carriers trust SCA to help them avoid unnecessary costs by handling every claim, every time with unparalleled accuracy and a commitment to doing things the right way. I mean, these guys are old school, right? Since 1979, SCA has been exceeding expectations. Only a company dedicated to serving and taking care of people, including their adjusters, can a company like this continue to grow in this industry. Join the team with industry-leading NPS scores and cycle times that has the resources to bring new opportunities for not only auto adjusters, but now for property adjusters. To get started with SCA Claim Services, head on over to adjustertv.com slash SCA. And while you're there, don't forget to download the totally free SCA Claim Services Field Adjuster Gear Guide. Again, that's adjustertv.com slash SCA to download the free gear guide and to apply. Ultimately, it's going to come down to what the scope is and the scope of damages. Um, being on the IA side, I know that that a lot of the times that you were you had a lot of claims to touch, especially if you know if 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 that was from a windstorm or a hailstorm, you've got a lot of claims to touch. And to try to actually get up in the attic, find out the details, look at exactly what's damaged, and come up with a very very complete estimate that touches everything from the very beginning. Is, is going to be tough, not impossible. And there's some can do it, but there's a lot that can't. Um, so if the PA is already taking the time to get an engineer in there, to have a um, know that he's got trusses in there and not rafters, that he's going to have to have architectural stamps on any repairs to prove that he did the right things back to um, building code standards, it could be just a difference in scope and that could very easily be settled with a another inspection, uh, a reinspection to verify. Okay, this is what we're looking at. This is why we're looking at it, and and we're going to agree to this. Um, if it gets contentious beyond that, with that kind of a separation, what happens then is you start to look at what are the dispute resolution portions of the policy. Um, you know, on the initial inspection, the public adjusters. Um, whatever happens on the initial inspection is just their first step. They have many more steps to go through, whereas the independent adjuster, once they've done that first one, is not very likely to be called back out to that house to, to deal with that claim again. So, you know, to you as the independent adjuster, you write the best estimates that you can, but you know that, you know, you're going to move on down the road and, and, and go forward. Well, that public adjuster, he's handling that claim from the time that he gets the contract signed and the claims filed until payment is made. So he knows that there's going to be more than one step. So what, what they will do is they'll, you know, again, if they need a second inspection, very likely they can get that call back out and say, okay, look, this is why we need these things. We need architectural stamps on the trusses. The architect says we got to do X, you know, Y, and Z. 
this is the reasons that I need these things. And then you have to sit and review that and to see where does that go next? Um, if it's still at a separation where it can't be satisfied, now we're gonna start talking dispute resolutions. Um, dispute resolutions are uh, usually either mediation or appraisal. They're specifically listed out in that policy. So again, you have to know the policy language in that policy to be sure that you're dealing with that exact dispute resolution terminology. Um, on a mediation in Florida, um, the mediator may or may not have any building um, experience. It's very likely to be a retired judge or a retired attorney, and uh, maybe they're great at mediating and, and, and negotiating, but they may not know the difference between a rafter and a truss. So, you know, you have that issue. Um, once the mediation is completed, then you have a three-day rescission period where either side can say, no, I, I don't like how that came out. We need to do something else. Um, if you go to an appraisal, then two, uh, generally it's independent, non-biased appraisers are assigned, one from the insurance company side, one from the insured side, and they meet back at the property and again, have that discussion of, okay, it would be similar to a second inspection, but they have a little bit more authority. Right. And, and their goal is to meet and agree to a scope of damage. Once both the adjusters can agree, okay, this is what the repairs are. We agree that this is what needs to be repaired. The price can usually take care of itself because we know what labor costs are, or those are easy enough to figure out, and we can figure out what material costs are. So it's easy to verify the, the expense of it pretty quickly as long as we can agree what's to be repaired. Now, generally, a appraisal doesn't discuss coverage. They discuss damage and scope of damage. Right. Even if the appraisers agree to a, you know, a, a settlement, it still goes back to the insurance company and they look at it and apply coverage and you know then things can still get interesting from there then yeah the, the it, final step that oh, happened after that is that you can get an attorney involved and, and now we we're moving on to a another complicated set of issues and where life goes forward from there right um, again that's going to depend upon the state and the settlement procedures in that state yeah, and I think it's important for um, adjusters to know, especially if they're working CAT, is that, like you said, they're, they're probably not going to be more than one, maybe two touches to that claim at the, at the mm -hmm. initial inspection, you know, really like right after the loss, because a, a catastrophe adjuster, the catastrophe team, they're going to come in and they're going to do a high volume of claims first inspections and they're going to try and write the I mean as, as a catastrophe adjuster I'm going to try and write a complete claim because I know that down the road the desk adjuster is going to have to get probably get involved at some point at mm -hmm. the minimum to write replacement costs you know checks right um, yeah so I can help that person out a lot I can help the insurance company out a lot by writing everything that I reasonably can that that I'm allowed to that I'm covered or that I'm as, as I'm authorized, I guess I should say, to uh, take mm -hmm. care of initially, um, and keeping in mind that some carriers don't let the IAs include overhead and profit on their first estimate, um, mm -hmm. and they may even get a little bit, you know, kind of not let us do a lot of stuff on the front side, as as an independent adjusters on CAT, um, and maybe there's some. Uh, uh, building code situations or engineers. A lot of times we're not authorized to request an engineer, our own engineer, um, without going through a bunch of hoops and getting permission and stuff. Um, so, and, and the appraisal stuff and the mediation stuff and all that stuff kind of on the back end, an independent adjuster mm -hmm. nine, 99 times out of a hundred is not going to be involved in that. Um, because the carrier and the insured are going to be kind of doing that the ia firm's kind of out of it so the ias aren't really involved um interestingly um there is you know, are you, you're familiar with ccms and associates the ia firm oh yeah yeah so those mm -hmm. guys have a really really cool service uh called dispute resolution that is kind of wants to be the step after or before it goes to appraisal or before it goes to any kind of like official um sort of 
uh, remedy under the policy. It's like they do a first inspection, and then maybe they do a reinspection, and then maybe the something happened during that where they they still disagree on the price, or there's a little bit gets contentious or whatever. CCMS will come in and say, "All right, hold on, hold on, let's talk about this," and they try to get. They try to resolve the claim before it goes any further, um, so and they will be dealing with a lot of PAs. I don't know if you've if you've ran into those guys um, on the PA side. Um, I, I not only ran into them. I, I worked for them for about a year doing just exactly that here in yeah. Florida. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work? but still small enough to know you by your first name. Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Pacesetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Pacesetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, You'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. And Paysetter is bringing training to a city near you. Check out their summer tour dates at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. I was on the dispute resolution. That's exactly what I wrote in. And I, I was the one on, on the IA side doing that negotiation with the public adjusters, trying to get that completed and solved before it went to the attorney's office. Um, so I'm, I'm intimately familiar with that situation. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's something that they still do, and I know that they they are hiring for that kind of thing um, for the you know the right candidates, the right the people who have the, the kind of the right experience set. Um, they do offer some training on that. Last time I talked to them, um, but I think that that's a, kind of a unique sort of service that they offer um, that I think is probably absolutely beneficial for both sides. I mean, cause they're trying to re get that claim resolved before it gets tangled up with attorneys and you know, everybody else. Well, you really and, don't want to. And again, ultimately, you know, we talk about both sides, but the, but the ultimate answer is how can we service the insured the quickest and the best? And yeah. if that's how we can do it by um, a dispute resolution and, and that's a formalized process of doing a second inspection. Like is a lot of other companies, they go back out with a second inspection with possibly a more experienced adjuster that could look at things and, and, and realize that, hey, look, it, it needs, you know, this and this and this and some of those things that, that PA is asking for are pretty doggone reasonable. We need, we need to address this. Um, and, and there might be other things that are, no, it's you're kind of stretching it a little bit here. But the point is that that's part of the process. And again, we've got to look at what's the best for the insured. You know, in your example of, of, of the tree falling through the roof, I mean, if it's truly damaged the roof that bad, the, the, the next question it really has to become is, is that a, a home that should be um, habitable? Should it be lived in? Yeah. Um, maybe your best thing that you can do is the independent adjusters, even from right there on the, the scene, call up the desk adjuster and say, hey, look, you know, I got a tree through the roof. It's cracked at least four or five rafters and they have no business living in this house. Um, not only do we have a complicated estimate, these people are going to need some ALE, you know, pronto. Yeah. How can we help them as quickly as we can? Yeah. And adjusters, I mean, it doesn't take, it just, I mean, it's, that's a three to five minute long phone call. You might have to call your manager first, uh, oh. but you probably can find out the information from the, from the file, who the desk adjuster is. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of those kind of things. So when you go above and beyond, even that's that's one of those like five percent or ten percent above and beyond sorts of things that I talk about. Um, that kind of will place an adjuster in the top twenty, top ten percent of adjusters when they just do that. Those, those little small extra things helps out the insured. It helps out the desk adjuster because you know it may be three or four weeks go by and all of a sudden they get a gigantic stack of bills from hotels and meals and stuff. They, they get blindsided by it. And we're like, where did this come from? So exactly. if you, if, and and nobody wants to be surprised. And that's never a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the desk adjusters, they remember the file reviewers, remember the IA firms, remember um, the carriers. I always tell people this, I'm like, you know, the, the, the real first call list is 
the carrier has it, right? When you do when you do things like that, mm-hmm. you will become known to the carrier. They'll see that you've got good volume, you're taking care of the customers, you've got you know good technical accuracy on your estimates. Um, they're going to say next time they get a big storm in Kansas City, we need 50 adjusters, and if you've got these 10 people. Will you send them as well? Because we want them to be on this storm. If your name is on that list, you're yeah. going to be busy all the time. And, um, and that's where I had the, the, the relationship with the vendors that I work for. Um, I almost always had the authority to go straight to a desk adjuster if I needed to. Uh, another way is an independent adjuster you can look to stand out is that this is something that I did. It's not that it happened a lot, but if I got um, a... Uh, inspection with an insured or an insurance contractor or public adjuster that didn't go well and was possibly less than professional and, you know, feelings are hurt and and emotions are high. Uh, I I would, you know, when completed and everybody's, you know, settled, I drive away from the area. But then the first thing I do is I would stop. I would call my vendor manager and discuss with him this, Hey, you know, don't be surprised if you get a complaint on this file because, you know, things didn't go as nicely as I'd like. And then I'd immediately call up the desk adjuster and say, hey, look, um, be prepared. There, there may be a complaint come down from, from on high above saying that this didn't go very well. And I want you to be aware of what the facts were as I saw them at the time that we were there. Oh, yeah. I, I would call it a, a critical a field adjuster or just an adjuster skill in general is keeping people in the loop. You know, in that same scenario, I'm going to make a third call. I'm going to call the agent for the, you know, if, if they're a, a carrier yeah, that yeah. has, that uses agents for their sales, I'm going to say, Hey, listen, just came from Mr. So-and-so's house. Um, there's a disagreement on the coverage or the, this or the, that, or the damage or whatever. Just want to let you know, he'd probably be giving you a call. Um, if you have any questions or, you know, whatever, you, you feel free to give me a call back. My number is this. Um, I'm going to call my manager and give them a heads up and so on and so forth. And then everybody's in the loop because if your manager's phone rings, with the insured's angry and then followed right by the agent who's got just got an earful from the insured, the manager is not get you. You get remembered the wrong way, basically. So absolutely, and and you're absolutely right about calling the agent. That one just kind of slipped my mind. I haven't dealt with agents in almost a year now. Yeah. So it didn't. I just forgot. But yeah, the the first phone call I would make would be to the agent. Why? Because that's the first person the insured's going to call. Yeah. And, and then I had to talk to my vendor management and then up to the desk adjuster to let everybody know. But, but again, it's, it's that little bit that you can do that's, that's over and above so that you can, um, like you said, keep the communication open with everybody. It's, it's so important that if you all just communicate and let, you, let each other know what you're thinking of, why do you need these repairs? Why do you think I don't need these repairs? all right, let's discuss this and, and move forward. And, and ultimately, always keep in mind that, that, that we are both standing there trying to help the insured get through possibly one of the worst days of their lives. Yeah. So how can we do that the best that we can as quickly as we can? You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Exactly. And even if it's a small claim, it can, it's still something that they have to deal with. Even if it's water spot on the ceiling, three tabs missing, one section of fence blown down. I, I mean, a kitchen leak, you know, a, a kitchen sink blowing a pea trap and, and spewing all over the kitchen. It could be the biggest catastrophe that they've ever had. So to them, that's huge. Yeah. You know, to us, it's like, okay, I see three of these a week. What's the big deal? You know, so it's, it's right. perspective. You have to keep that in perspective. And, you know, again, I have the history of working as a firefighter paramedic. You know, if nobody's house is on fire, people aren't jumping out of the windows or I'm not doing CPR on grandma. 
life is pretty good. <laughs> I can deal with the rest of it pretty easy. There's no stress. But yeah. it, it's all perspective. And you have to look at it from their eyes, not yours. Yep. Yep. And then I would, yeah, I'd take it even a step further. Yeah, when you say their it. eyes, that's everybody's eyes, right? So the homeowner's eyes, your, your I firm team manager's eyes, the carriers, mm -hmm. you know, the file reviewers, everybody's eyes. Like how, how is my writing this claim, putting this claim together going to uh, make this easier for downstream people? Right. Um, because ultimately yes. you don't want clients yes, to go to court. You don't want them to be contentious. You don't want anybody to be mad and upset and have hurt feelings. I mean, it may happen. Somebody misunderstands during your first inspection, uh, but you can still pull that kind of thing out of the fire if you get on the phone fast enough and, you know, really try to set an expectation with the insured in particular that you're there to help them get back to pre-loss condition. I mean, it's, it's, it's something I think that, like you said, I, adjusters kind of forget um, and they, they're out there just want, you know, doing six, seven, maybe eight or 10, even 10 like hail claims a day. And they get into this groove and they forget that they're not like just this monolith out in the world all by themselves, that they've got a whole team of people behind them and they got people in front of them and they got to take care of everybody while they're taking care of themselves. Um, but I wanted to, I not going to, this isn't going to be like a 20, 20, 60 minutes gotcha question, but I'm curious what do you think that some of the changes that we've been seeing lately in technology, as far as the photo and scope stuff, how is that affecting how you guys as public adjusters are handling claims or is it even affecting it at all? When you have like somebody who's not really an adjuster showing up with their phone and taking pictures and then some remote desk adjuster 2,500 miles away, writing it up. In my humble opinion, from my side of it, I see that as doing nothing except creating more business and 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 more success for public adjusters. Um, <laughs> that's just overall not going to work well, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think it's it's a good investigation technique. Maybe it can develop into one, but um, I I tell you what, I've been submitting my claims now as a public adjuster just like I submitted them as an independent adjuster. I submit a full claim with the estimate. Um, all of the um, sketches are annotated. All of the kitchen cabinets are put into place. All of the sinks are put into place. All of the toilets are put into place. I annotate everything so that we all know where the damage is, what happened, what the length of everything is. I combine that with a photo port report that's annotated I point out the damage. I make it very clear and very easy for the desk adjuster to say, here, look at this. It, it's, it's right here. Here's the big arrow pointing to whatever I see is damaged. And then I follow that up with a narrative report, just like I did as an IA saying, okay, we met Mr. Mr. Smith at his house. We, we found the leak under his sink and it damaged this, this, and this. And because of the open concept of his Florida house, we're painting you know, A, B, C, D, and E rooms because they are all continuous. Right. Um, and I explain it all like that. And by us as public adjusters submitting reports that are similar to what they used to get from an IA report, the desk adjusters that know what a good report looks like is going to see that. And they're going to see my name attached to that. And they're going to see my company attached to that. And I'm hoping that that will help them realize that, hey, look, I'm not asking for silly things, but I am asking for enough to take care of the insured, and here's my reasoning why. Yeah. Yeah, it, it goes, it's across the board. I was a staff adjuster for a little while for a, a major um, carrier, and I had a territory, and I developed relationships with the contractors in the area. Um, and by relationship, I mean that I knew what to expect from them. I knew if they were going to argue with me on certain things. Um, I knew where our common ground was. Um, and then you, you kind of develop a reputation as uh, an adjuster that is fair and that is telling the truth. You know, they, they can dig and they can see, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, he wrote this, he wrote his estimate perfectly or, you know, as close to how we'd wanted to have him do it as, as possible. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, we'll, 
we'll work with Matt a lot easier than we would with somebody else who's just coming in cold um, that they don't know, right? So I think there's a lot of value in being known, and this goes for, I think, in your business as well as an independent adjuster's business where, like we were talking about earlier, you get known for doing that little extra 5%, 10% thing um, mm -hmm. that it only benefits your business. Um, so I, and I, I have kind of a last question for you. Um, if, if we lived in a perfect world, right, where every adjuster wrote every claim exactly perfectly that the contractor took a look at the estimate and said, looks perfect, we can work from this, it's exactly the right amount of money that we need to do the work. In that world, do we need public adjusters? These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now i believe even in that world there would be a place for public adjusters because there's there's still claims and situations where it works out better um take an example in an apartment complex it gets you know nailed by hail so now we have ceiling and roof damage across multiple buildings and nobody in that complex management shall we say is an experienced person in insurance we could be talking millions of dollars here for the proper repairs. That's not really something you should manage as, as, as an apartment complex manager. That's something that you need to transfer over to somebody like a public adjuster because that's our expertise. Um, consider it another way, an individual that, uh, I don't wanna quite say high net worth, but maybe so, but let's just say he's busy working and doesn't really have the time to take care of you know, meeting with the insurance company and looking at this and doing that and doesn't want to deal with the intricacies. Well, that's a still another good reason to hire a public adjuster so that we can take care of the um, details of the claim. And, you know, for, for a, a 10 to 20 percent cost that, that, that we charge, a lot of people wouldn't think twice about paying that because, hey, I didn't have to meet with the adjuster. I didn't have to negotiate. I didn't have to make phone calls. It was all done for me. Um, and, and the last one that can really be helpful is that if the claim is written well and it's done properly, this one doesn't apply near as often. But the reality is sometimes these claims are not written as well as they might be to some of the lower income, lower education uh, population. And sometimes the public adjusters step in and take those claims, even if the pay on it isn't very high, uh, sometimes we'll do it for nothing just because we don't feel right taking, you know, 20% out of a $5,000 claim. Sure. But I believe that she really deserves to have that $5,000 claim. So again, it's, in, in a perfect world, there would be a lot less need for public adjusters. I, I agree with that. Would there ever be a place for no need? Uh, not in my opinion. I still think there's places that they can be extremely valuable. I mean, one of the houses I'm handling right now is a $2.8 million house that's in the middle of getting their complete tile roof replaced and has interior damage. Well, you know, again, you don't do a job like that real quick, right? Well, right. 
the whole tile roof was off and it rained. Oh, no. Now, is that going to be part <laughs> of the insurance claim or is that going to be something else? And again, this is where I can help this person that um, has done well in life and doesn't know anything about insurance. Uh, this is where I can add my experience to him and help them take care of this problem uh, because this is going to get a little bit more interesting and this is still a claim in progress. Right. So, so the bottom line really is, is that, you know, it's just kind of like, um, an attorney, like attorneys, the, the purpose of attorneys isn't to chase ambulances necessarily. Right. Um, but they do mm -hmm. some of them. And the purpose of a PA isn't there to just go out and try to make 10 or 20% on every single claim that they can just by fluffing everything up. It, they're really, it's, it's, um, it's more of a service, um, like you said, especially for um, commercial in policy holders who may not, they just s simply have zero time to go out to send somebody out, property manager or whoever, to go meet with adjusters and go through the rigmarole when they can just hire somebody, pay a little extra money, and have somebody else take care of it for them. I mean, that's, we do that all the time with all kinds of things. Um, and then... Uh, that's that's very interesting about the kind of the sort of the altruistic side of it. I'm sure that um, you know, as a as an independent adjuster, not everybody does this, but but a lot of adjusters do. Where if they go to an insurance house and the file's not covered, like I'll still write an estimate for the for the homeowner to help them in whatever way that I can. You know, say this is a an estimate of what we think it's going to be what I think it would be to, to do this work. And you can take this to your contractor and, and work it out with them. If you have questions, you can call me. Um, sure. We can make ourselves available to help in that way. Obviously I can't, you know, be spending any money as an IA um, to help them in that way. But as a public adjuster, I mean, if you're able to do pro bono stuff for people that, that may not have the resources or the sophistication to um, handle that on their own or deal with a, a insurance company that they're, he, I mean, there's the conventional wisdom out there is that the insurance companies don't want to pay and they're going to drag out the process, right? There's two big things I always hear. Um, whether those are true or not, it doesn't really matter. People believe it, right? And so they may, they yeah. may want to hire somebody to help them through that process. So I, you know, I've, like I said, I've really only had one PA that I was like, come on, man. <laughs> you know, the rest of them were pretty cool. Um, so I, haven't, I don't have any big horror stories about it. Um, but I think that, that, you know, they're not going away. And adjusters do have to deal with them, especially on big losses, on the, all the hurricanes we had in 2020, all the fires, all that stuff. Um, those are claims that I think probably could benefit from the assistance of, of, of a public adjuster just to keep everybody on the straight and narrow to help guide the insured and to even in some cases maybe help guide the, in, the adjuster um, to, to make a more complete estimate up front so that there's the insured's getting, you know, not having to do a bunch of arm wrestling on the back end with the carrier to get what they, they actually really do deserve. So um, any last yeah. thoughts you, you've got for us? I, I just want to connect back to your thought about, you know, producing that estimate for the, the insured that may or may not be covered. Uh, one of the things I was always taught by all my vendors is that you write the damage until the damage is gone. You don't write the damage to the policy limits. Right. Uh, I don't pretend to be a tax attorney. I, I'm, I'm not giving tax advice, but I have been told on more than one occasion through more than one source that let's throw out the example if, if your claim um, the insurance company paid $20,000, but the reality is it took $30,000 to fix the problem. Well, that extra $10,000 that you took the time to write over the, was the policy limits or you know the, the proper way to make the repairs, that's something that can be used to their advantage when they file their taxes next oh, yeah. year. Because that's money that's gonna be out of their pocket in order to fix their house. So again, it's all doing that little bit extra, whichever side of the fence you're on, you know, again, my, 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 my ending advice to, to, to IAs, or especially CAT IAs that have never dealt with public adjusters, it's just another person. You know, if, if you go out there and you, you greet them and treat them with respect from the very beginning, 90% of them are gonna give you nothing but respect back. And if you happen to be, you know, so brand new that this is your first deployment and you're scared, don't worry. We were doing our first claim one time too, whichever side we were on. Right. So we understand. 
But the ultimate, again, always keep in mind that ultimate goal, how can we help the insured as quickly as possible? That's what I try to do. Yeah, that's what, what we're supposed to do. I mean, that's, you know, you, I've never been in an orientation meeting where they said, all right, we're gonna not pay and drag the process out as much as possible. It just never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good state farm manager. Um, one of my first storms, we went up to work with Sandy. And he called, it was just for auto at the time, but it was, you know, he called us in a group of about 20 people. And, and he looked at us and says, you know something? I can fix it if you lose a checkbook. I can fix it if you write a check that's higher than it should be. I can fix it if you're late to an appointment. I can fix almost anything that you do, but I can't fix bad customer service yeah if you provide good customer service and stub your toe on another piece or two we can fix that but i can't fix bad customer service yeah 100 percent. so if people want more information about dave hall and golden trails public adjusters where can we send them we have a web page golden trails.com that's golden hyphen trails dot com um and obviously you can always you know get in contact with me i'm quite active on facebook uh, since i was an ia i'm still hiding around on a lot of the ia sites but i'm also active on the public adjusting sites uh we work out of florida but right now we're already in the process of getting our ohio license and uh i've already talked to people as powerful and as knowledgeable as chip merlin that is suggested to me as a new public adjuster just just like a cat i Go out and get your license in as many states as you can, as quick as you can, and, and you will find work. Even if it's, you know, for a few weeks at a time, I can go out as a public adjuster and help, again, public adjusting firms get claims started and written up so that the process can get started. But I may not be there for the end of the claim like we typically are as a public adjuster. Nice. Well, very cool. Thanks so much, Dave, for coming on and talking to us about public adjusting and kind of the ins and outs of it and what their real purpose is. And uh, I wish you the best of luck going forward. And, and uh, again, you guys can reach uh, look, reach Dave at golden-trails.com, right? And uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll catch up with we you on the next one. And also, if you want to call my phone number directly, it's 321-209-1950. Uh, Awesome. Are you in the Adjuster TV Facebook group? I am. Um, by all means, post up and, and tag Dave Hall. And uh, he'll, he'll, his. Uh, by all means. He's active in there, so he'll definitely jump on with you. All right, Dave. I appreciate it, man. We'll catch up with you on the next one. Thank you very much. You bet. Appreciate you having me. Anytime. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.